Welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. Uh, we have a Grand Round speaker today. Our Grand Round speaker is Dr. Jean Kunjuman. Uh, we are honored to have her. Uh, Dr. Kunjuman is a breast imaging radiologist at Emory uh, School of Medicine and also the director of breast imaging at Emory University Hospital Midtown. Uh, the topic today is very pertinent. It is digital breast tomosynthesis. Uh, I know many of you are going to watch this live while some of you will be watching this recorded. Um, and um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom, which we can address after the grand rounds. Um, or you can also email it to us and then we can uh, forward it to Dr. Kunjaman. All right, um, thank you so much Jean, for doing this for us, for Help of the World, and we really appreciate this. We have audience from about 80 countries who, um, who watches this, so this is very helpful and uh, you can start whenever you are ready. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you, Dr. Rani, for um, inviting me, and I'm excited to give this presentation about the digital breast tomosynthesis. I do not have any um, conflict of in interest disclosure. So this presentation will give you an overview of the following areas. What is digital breast tomosynthesis and why it should be performed? A basic technical principle behind the tomosynthesis, a brief overview of the clinical data out there, some practical applications um, of tomosynthesis by sharing day-to-day -day examples, and how do we do the biopsy seen only on tomosynthesis, and lastly, our experience of tomosynthesis at Emory. So I'm going to start with the first question. What are the advantages of adding digital breast tomosynthesis to digital 2D mammogram? A is increase in cancer detection rate and decrease in callback rate. B is increase in cancer detection rate and increase in callback rate. And C is similar in cancer detection rate and callback rate as full fleet 2D digital mammography. Think about the answer to those questions. So we all know that mammography is a great screening tool. It has shown that annual screening mammography can decrease the death rate from breast cancer by about 50% but it still has its limitations. About 20% of the breast cancer can be missed by full-field digital mammography. And on the other hand, about 10% of the screening women are called back for additional imaging, and majority of them prove to have no abnormality, which results in unnecessary anxiety and also drives up the healthcare cost. So, the superimposition of normal breast tissue is the major limiting factor of 2D mammography. If you think about it, breast is a three-dimensional organ that we are imaging on a 2D film. So what happens? Normal breast tissue overlap on each other and two things can happen, which is illustrated on this slide. Here you could see the normal uh, breast tissue as um, blue circles and the um, cancer as a red. So when you have superimposition of the normal breast tissue, um, you could see how the, uh, that can hide a cancer, and at the same time, it can cause a pseudomass, which leads me to the discussion of um, tomosynthesis and how it is performed. So the patient is positioned just like 2D mammography, but the difference is the X-ray tube moves in an arc across the breast on tomosynthesis, whereas on the 2D mammography, the X-ray tube is stationary, and it acquires multiple low-dose images from different angles. And these are called the projection images. So these projection images are then reconstructed into thinner tomosynthesis slices. So you get a stack of images on CC projection and another stack of images in the MLO projection. 
So when you scroll through um, the stack of images, for example, here in CC projection, you could see on um, slide 12, you see normal breast tissue. And on slide 36, you see the normal breast tissue. And then on slide 36, you see the cancer well because you don't have the surrounding superimposition of the normal breast tissue. In other words, the overlapping tissue on, these, on that particular stomosynthesis slice is out of focus, and therefore you could detect the cancer. The best analogy that I can use is when you have a chest x-ray, right? Just the AP or a PA view of the chest x-ray, you could see how the um, ribs are overlying over the lungs and over the mediastinum and over the soft tissue. So if you see a mass on the, let's say, on um, along the overlying the lung, you don't know if it's coming from mediastinum, you don't know if it's coming from the bone, um, it could be coming from the soft tissue, but uh, when you do a computer tomography, because you're slicing through that chest and you're getting a stack of images, you could see the area much better than when you do um, just one AP or PA view of the chest. So this is a um, video of how tomosynthesis is done, and I got it from the Hologic, which, was, which is one of the manufacturers. So here you could see the patient is positioned just like the 2D mammography, but um, just watch the um, X-ray tube where it moves. Okay, hold still. Now the patient is going to be positioned on the MLO view, just like the 2D mammogram. And so you get a stack of images on this here. You can see on the MLO projection. And the technologist can scroll through it. And the radiologist can look under the, um, on the, on the work, workstation, scrolling through that stack of images. So the question becomes is like, oh, are we we're done with the tomosynthesis images? Do we still need a 2D image? And the answer is yes. And the reason is mainly for calcification evaluation. So when you have a suspicious distribution such as a segmental and grouped calcification, it is harder to appreciate on the tomo slices because the calcification traverses on multiple slices on tomo, whereas it's much more easier for your eye to perceive that suspicious distribution when it's on 2D image. The second thing is when you compare the current image with the prior mammograms, we all know that is the standard mammography practice. And this is particularly important when your facility is switching from 2D mammogram to TOMO. So you can compare a current 2D um, to prior 2D rather than a current TOMO to prior TOMO. So there are two ways that you can obtain the 2D film along with the tomosynthesis images. 
One is full field digital mammography with the tomosynthesis, and second is a synthetic digital mammography with the tomosynthesis. I'll both I'll explain both in some detail. So the first one is full field digital mammal with tomosynthesis. So here what happens is the X-ray tube moves in an arc and a series of um, projection images are acquired. So that is the tomosynthesis part of it. And now the X-ray tube comes back to the center and, um, and we get a additional 2D image under the same compression. So what happened is like you get a perfectly co-registered 2D image and TOMO images under one compression. The second way is um, called the synthetic digital mammal with tomosynthesis. So you perform a standard tomosynthesis scan, and from the tomosynthesis slices that you got, a computer software algorithm is applied, and that creates a generated 2D image instead of the additional 2D image. So that is called the synthetic digital mammography. So when you compare those two ways of getting the um, uh, 2D with um, tomosynthesis, you could see um, when you have the tomo with the full field digital mammography, obviously because we're doing an additional picture, the scan time is about 10 seconds. And the, or, whereas on the TOMO with the synthetic digital mammography, because we're doing one less additional picture, the scan time is less. And the ACR dose is about 2.7 milligray, which is still below the MQSA guideline of 3.0 milligray. But uh, on the other hand, since uh, we're doing the synthetic um, digital mammal, the ACR dose is about 1.5 milligrams. So there's an average reduction of about 40% when synthetic um, digital mammal is used instead of the full field digital mammal with tomosynthesis. The additional benefit is that since the task, a scan time is reduced, there's always a lower risk of patient motion. Um, I want to talk a little bit brief about um, the overview of published clinical data out there. So there are numerous uh, peer-reviewed publications worldwide, multi-center, and single institution study, which reported overall reduction recall rates anywhere from 15 to about 37 percent and about up to 54% increase in cancer detection rate when used um, TOMO relative to the uh, conventional 2D digital mammography. One of the largest um, 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 clinical data came from a was published in JAMA in 2014, which looked at about a half a million examinations. So what they found out was the overall cancer detection rate increased about 30%. But most importantly, the invasive cancer detection rate increased about 41%, and the recall reduction was about 15%. So if you look at the um, average, like if you look at the clinical data with the tomosynthesis, there's about 40% increase in cancer detection rate when you add tomo to the, um, um, with, the, with the 2D mammogram. So the most common finding that was called back that has shown to be cancer is architectural distortion. We all know that architectural distortion is the most commonly missed mammographic finding on 2D screening mammogram. About 50% of the cancers presenting as distortion can be occult on 2D digital mammogram. It's also important to know that the invasive cancers that are found on tomosynthesis tend to have better prognosis, they tend to be smaller in size, lower in grade, and tend to be node negative. And on the other hand, there's about 20% recall reduction um, rate. 
And the asymmetry, which is um, as a review, is when you have one view finding, is the mammal abnormality most commonly affected by the addition of um, tomosynthesis with about 60% reduction in recall rate. Based, and it, this makes sense because multiple slices through the tomosynthesis will show that this is just normal superimposed breast tissue, which can be seen as high density summation on 2D mammogram, which you have, we would have called that um, asymmetry back if we did not have the tomo. Also, when you look at the baseline mammogram, um, there was about 20, 22% reduction in recall rate. It's also important to know that with tomosynthesis, there was no significant improvement in the detection of malignant microcalcification, which is usually seen with DCIS. So it's actually a good thing because the preferential improved um, specificity and sensitivity for invasive cancer addresses the critique's concern about overdiagnosis. So one of the arguments of routine screening um, is overdiagnosis, which critiques say that the cancer may never have become clinically significant, and this is usually associated with low-grade DCIS and not invasive cancer. So there are several studies um, which showed the use of synthetic mammal um, instead of the full-field digital mammal with tomosynthesis having similar screening outcomes while reducing the radiation dose. So one of them is the Oslo Tomosynthesis Screening Trial, which was a, pros uh, was a prospective study um, um, that was uh, done from 2010 to 2012. So they included about 24,000 women. So what they did was they compared a digital mammogram, then they compared digital mammogram with tomosynthesis, and then the synthetic mammogram with the tomosynthesis. So as with like multiple other studies, when um, digital mammal with the tomosynthesis resulted in um, increase in cancer detection rate and decrease in the callback rate compared to just 2D mammography alone. But one of the other things that they found out was the synthetic mammal with the tomosynthesis had similar sensitivity and specificity to the full fledged digital mammal with tomosynthesis which is a great news because now we can reduce um, um, the radiation dose uh, with the um, uh, tomosynthesis. So we're back to question number one, as what are the advantages of adding digital breast tomosynthesis to digital 2D mammogram? And the answer to that is A, increase in cancer detection rate and decrease in callback rate. The second question I have is, which breast density groups benefit the most from tomosynthesis? A is heterogeneously dense and extremely dense. B is heterogeneously dense and scattered fibroglandular tissue. And C is scattered fibroglandular tissue and predominantly fatty. And question number three is, do all women, whether they have dense and non-dense breast breast benefit from tomosynthesis. So the, um, there was a study that was published in JAMA on tomosynthesis on breast density, which um, looked at about um, 460,000 examination comparing the full field digital mammal versus digital mammal with tomosynthesis. So what they found out was addition of tomosynthesis to digital mammography for screening was associated with increase in cancer detection rate and, excuse me, and reduction in the recall rate for all women, regardless of their density. So whether they are both dense and non-dense breast tissue. And the largest benefit was seen on heterogeneously dense and scattered fibroglandular densities. Um, you know, when you think about it, the, the reason that women with extremely dense breasts, which is, um, uh, it's a subjective 
measurement, but it's usually greater than 75% of fibroglandular tissue had comparatively less benefit is due to the fact that there's reduced intrinsic tissue contrast. So if you look at completely dense breast, right? Uh, when you, even when you go through the um, tomosynthesis slides, for your eye to perceive the mass really well or perceive the distortion well, you need some um, intervening fat um, to help us to perceive it better. So that's why extremely dense breast tissue, even though it did help, it was less beneficial than somebody with heterogeneously dense breast. So I want to show you some examples of how TOMO helps us with the cancer detection. So this is a case uh, one, the patient presented for um, screening, both full field digital mammo and TOMO synthesis studies will be shown. So here you see um, a 2D mammography. It's the patient, it's this heterogeneously dense, and when you look at it, it's essentially negative. But when you look at the tomosynthesis um, slides through it, you could see how you could see this mass really well because the surrounding breast tissue is out of focus on that slide, and therefore you not only see the mass, but you also see the margins of the mass. In this case, you could see the speculations coming out of the mass. So when you compare like spot compression to spot compression, you could see how easily this can be seen well on tomosynthesis, and that's how our eye can detect the cancer much better on tomosynthesis. And in this case, this happened to be invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, this is the second case for routine screening study. So here you see um, on the 2D um, digital uh, image, you really don't see anything um, on the 2D mammography. And on the screening mammography, on the screening tomosynthesis, you could see a subtle architectural distortion, which um, again, um, with completely, the 2D mammography is completely negative. And in this case, um, this was um, biopsy proven in infiltrating lobular carcinoma. So um, this is an example of tomosynthesis on diagnostic setting. So the patient presents with focal pain. And um, at our institution, when the patient presents with focal pain, we do a spot compression image of that area. And so here you could see the um, full field digital mammogram is essentially negative at the um, area of the focal pain, which was around like 12 o'clock. And however, on the tomosynthesis um, slide, you could see there is a distortion at the um, at the area of the focal pain, which was not seen on the 2D mammogram. Again, on the CC view, you could see the distortion much better on the um, tomosynthesis compared to the 2D mammogram. And in this case, the core biopsy showed DCIS, which got upgraded to invasive cancer on surgery. Another um, screening exam. And here you could compare, I'm showing you the 2014 study and the 2018 study. And you could see on the 2D mammogram that essentially, um, the um, mammogram is negative and is also stable. The last four years, when you look at it, it is stable. But when you look at the TOMO images, you could see there is an area of distortion on the upper outer um, region, which was not seen on the 2D mammogram. And when you um, blow it up, you could see how 
you see the uh, mass with the distortion really well on tomosynthesis and it was essentially negative and stable on, um, on the 2D mammogram. And so in this case, this, is a, this was a screening. You could see both um, see on the CC and on an MLO view where it is. And so we don't have to do any additional pictures um, we can go directly to ultrasound rather than doing any additional pictures to evaluate for margins. Um, we can just go directly to the ultrasound. So we can, when we did the ultrasound from the screening, um, screening tomo uh, images, um, we could see a regular mass correlating to the area of distortion, and uh, this was biopsy proven to be grade one IDC. Um, this is an interesting case that um, this was a new asymmetry that was seen along the um, pect lower pectoralis muscle, right? So before, if we did not have a 2D, I'm sorry, if we did not have a TOMO image, um, you know, all of the breast images would say that this is a low axillary lymph node. Um, that is like the most common location for a low axillary lymph node. But since we had the TOMO, if you look at the TOMO um, um, stack of TOMO slices here, um, I'm not sure how well it is. This is M is the medial part of the breast and L is the lateral part of the breast. So you could see that this lesion is coming on focus towards the medial side of the breast. We all know that um, the... Um, if it's a low axillary lymph node, um, you know that this would be towards the, it would come in focus towards the lateral aspect of the breast and not the medial aspect of the breast. And by the way, this is um, just a classic fat necrosis calcification just incidentally found, in, incidentally seen. So because of the tomosynthesis and it, this was new and we knew that the um, we knew that um, this is not likely a axillary, low axillary lymph node. We called this patient back. As I said before, if we did not have the tumor images, we would have assumed that this patient, um, this was a low axillary lymph node. But um, the patient did not uh, come back. So she came back a year later, and you could see that now this um, area has increased in size, and there's also a second mass that formed uh, within a year worth of time. And here again, you could see, now you could see the mass on both sides, both of views, because it has gotten bigger, and there's also a second mass that was seen. So when you compare the current to the prior, you could see that the mass has increased in size. And again, like the uh, whole point of this is that TOMO has helped us to know that this is not a axillary, um, uh, low axillary lymph node, but rather a medial lesion. And we were able to find both um, lesions under ultrasound, and this turned, both of them turned out to be a grade three um, invasive ductal carcinoma. And um, now I'm going to switch to see, switch my um, cases to see how does TOMO helps us with the recall reduction. So case one um, is for the superimposition of the uh, breast tissue. So here you could see um, um, that there is a asymmetry in the subareolar region of the uh, breast. It's more high density. If we did not have the TOMO images, we would have called this back. But since um, we have the TOMO images, we, when we scroll through these slices, we could see that this is just um, breast tissue and not anything else. And so in this case, we can dismiss it as just breast tissue and don't have to call this patient back. And that's how we reduce our recall reduction. Um, the second case that I wanted to show is um, 
It's a TOMO with full field um, digital mammal. On the 2D, um, there was new indeterminate calcification in the posterior central breast. So here you could see there is new calcification on screening mammography, when obviously when we do have new calcification, we usually call the patient back. But when we go through the TOMO, you could see that these calcifications were on the first slide. So when these calcific when calcifications are on the first or last slices of the TOMO synthesis, we know that these are skin calcifications and we can dismiss that and we don't have to call the patient back. Remember, um, uh, whoever who did the, um, back in the days when we did the residency or when we were practicing before TOMO, um, in order to find out that if there was a skin calcification on 2D, what we had to do was we had to put the patient um, under compression, we have to put the um, alphanumeric grid, and we have to put the BB when you take the patient out of that, and then we have to do an orthogonal, we have to do um, a tangential view to find out that if these calcifications are on the um, skin. And for technologists, you know that one of the nightmares, because it is really hard, it's a lot of work to just to show that calcifications were skin on 2D mammography. Now with the 3D mammography, as long as this is in the first few slices, we know that these are skin calcifications. So from the screening perspective, you could see that we don't have to call these patients back. We can dismiss uh, with full confidence that these are skin calcifications. Um, on the, another um, case where um, uh, the on the CC view, there was a new asymmetry in the posterior central breast. So here you could see, again, when there is new asymmetries in the uh, posterior central breast, um, we usually call these patients back. That's what we do. But now with the tomosynthesis, you could see that this is the endon vessel. So it's just a blood vessel that you could see on the tomosynthesis really well. So again, we don't have to call these patients back, do additional imaging, and tell them that there is no um, abnormality, which is good in one way, but at the same time, we're increasing the patient anxiety, we're driving up the healthcare cost. Um, case four is again um, new asymmetry in the lateral breast. So we only saw this asymmetry on the 2D on, on um, uh, CC view, right? So before what we used to do was uh, before the tomosynthesis, we would have the patient come back and we would do a um, roll, spot images, roll images to find out the location in the orthogonal plane. And then we do the targeted ultrasound. But here we can see that on the tomosynthesis, we see the location on the MLO view. Not only we see the location, but we also see the margin of the location pretty well. So now we can go directly to ultrasound without doing any additional mammographic pictures. So here we can see that with tomosynthesis, we localize the lesion better and we can characterize the lesion better. And studies have shown that with the tomosynthesis, there's about 30% decrease in a number of additional images obtained, which again um, have faster um, diagnostic workup, greater, th greater throughput and improved resource utilization. And in this case, it was just a small cyst. So to recap, the advantages of digital breast tomosynthesis is mainly it reduces the overlapping of the breast tissue, which then we can characterize the lesion better. We see the distortions better, and we can localize the lesions better by finding the lesion within the stack of tomo images. Um, I want to um, talk about um, a few words about TOMO guided biopsy. So the uh, patient is positioned the same way as like a stereotactic biopsy. The breast is under compression 
and the technologist will perform a tomosynthesis scout, which gives you a stack of um, uh, images. So what we do is like we um, scroll through the slices and we find the slice that identify the lesion. So here you could see the slice that identified the lesion. And then once a slice is selected, the next step is to target the lesion. So then now the radiologist selects the biopsy site by selecting the target button. And then the software calculates the X, Y, and Z coordinate. But you also get a true picture of the biopsy uh, planning, including where the target is relative to the um, needle, uh, uh, needle aperture. And the next step is you prepare the area for biopsy, just like the um, stereotactic biopsy. You clean the skin, you inject the local anesthesia, followed by the introduction of the biopsy needle. The 2D uh, pre-fire and the post-fire is optional. And then the biopsy is performed and the post-tomo biopsy will confirm if the lesion has been sampled correctly. So in order to have the confirmation of the biopsy and the clip placement, what technologist does is um, the technologist perform another um, single tomo uh, acquisition after the clip placement. And then as radiologists, we scroll through that image and compare it to the original post biopsy scout. And what we're looking for is to make sure the lesion is gone, but more importantly, we need to compare the depth of the post-biopsy cavity with the pre-biopsy target lesion. So in here, you could see the, pre, uh, the slice was about 28 when we um, initially targeted, and the clip will, is seen around 21. So again, there's always going to be some post-biopsy changes, but as long as it is within the range, you know that you have done the adequate sampling of um, tumor-only seen biopsy. So for the tumor synthesis procedure, the total um, time to biopsy is definitely less than the stereo biopsies. It's usually like less than 10 minutes. Um, and in this case, the pathology resulted in invasive ductal carcinoma. And lastly, um, I wanted to um, show, I wanted to share our experience um, of um, converting from 2D mammography to tomosynthesis. We started in tw uh, beginning of 2014, and um, our cancer detection rate has increased by about 47%, and our recall rate was reduced by about 11%. So finally, what are the take-home points is that the tomosynthesis improves the detection of um, cancer, but especially the invasive cancer. It decreases the callback rate, which again decreases the anxiety, patient anxiety, and decreases the healthcare costs. And we can go directly to ultrasound without any additional mammographic images, especially from screening. Again, it decreases the additional radiation doses and also decreases the healthcare cost. And you can use the synthetic mammal with tomosynthesis. Uh, which has shown with multiple studies that it has similar screening outcomes as digital, fulfilled digital mammal with tomosynthesis while decreasing the radiation dose. But remember, radiation is doubled when you use a tomo with an addition of fulfilled digital mammography. And obviously, because now we have a stack of images um, our reading time for radiologists can be any can be increased anywhere from um, 1.5 to two times more than reading the um, regular 2D mammogram. And um, thank you for listening to my lecture. Um,
I'm happy. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanjiban. This was really excellent and very, very informative um, and a very good job of summarizing the breast homosynthesis. Um, so we have a few questions here. Um, the first one is, is there any added value for focus, focus ultrasound if TOMO is utilized for screening mammograms? Can you, um, sorry, can you repeat? Oh, okay, I can actually see it here. Is yeah. There any, is there any like um okay so if tomo is i'm not sure about the focused ultrasound i don't know if they if um they meant like screening ultrasound because like the whole point about um, the focused ultrasound is because if we, we use the tomo for screening mammogram so before i when you have a two D, before when we had the two D mammogram, what we used to do is um, two D screening mammogram. We used to bring the patient back for um, additional imaging. Uh, first of all, even if we saw it on two views, it's mainly to look at the margins of the lesion. But now with the tomosynthesis, you not only see the lesion well, but you also see the margin of the lesion really well on tomosynthesis. So you could just go directly to focused ultrasound um, rather than doing the additional mammal pictures. So the focused ultrasound is actually for, um, focus ultrasound is actually to, you know, ob obviously to evaluate the um, tomo finding, and if it's suspicious, to do the biopsy. Okay, that's great. Uh, there's another question by Dr. Lena Lambert. Uh, my question is about the cost impl implications of tomo. We are not currently using tomo, and I'm wondering how affordable it would be for our patients. Um, that is a good question as far as like, I do not have, I know there's three, um, vendors, um, Siemens, Hologic is the first one that came out, GE and, um, Hologic, GE and Siemens are the three, uh, uh, vendors that, uh, uh, that have the tomosynthesis. Uh, I, I have to, I'll have to look at the, I do not know the correct answer to the um, cost of it. I'm assuming it is, it is, would not be like something really, you know, cheap, like an ultrasound. It is actually a mammal machine. So, uh, but I do not have the um, answer to the actual cost of it. I can definitely, we use Hologic. So um, if, if you want, um, I could definitely get the answer for you um, and can email you. Um, is that the best way? I'm not sure like how are they, or do they want to email me? I'm trying to figure out how do yes. I get, yes. I get that. Yes, Dr. Lambert, you can just email uh, and you can see the email on the screen right now. So you can email the speaker directly or you can email us at Health for the World and we can forward the question uh, so, so, th so that it gets ans answered. Um, thank you so much. The next question is, um, what do you think about use of tomosynthesis in patients post-surgery of breast cancer by Dr. Enrique Manero? Sure. It is definitely a big, um, it's really helpful in post-lumpectomy um, and post-surgical patients. Um, so, you know, obviously the first post-surgical change, right? Um, no matter what, you know, it's, it's a distortion, so it is a distortion, but as long as what we do is like we put the scar marker where the distortion is going to be, so we know that it is um, that distortion, that architectural distortion is due to the post-surgical changes. But when, the, when it comes to the follow-up or like the next year or the follow-up, we can compare now the um, tomosynthesis, um, tomosynthesis 
um, slices from the first post-surgical change to the follow-up post-surgical change to see the post-surgical lump, especially lumpectomy cavities, to see if the, the border of the lumpectomy cavity. It's interesting that you say that because um, yesterday evening, my last case, um, I was working yesterday clinical, and my last case yesterday evening was a patient, post-lumpectomy patient, that um, when you compared the prior post-lumpectomy change to um, today's um, post-lumpectomy change, um, you could see um, the, the uh, convex margin of the change that which was much more easier seen on tomosynthesis. So I'm a really great advocate of using the tomosynthesis in post-surgical changes, um, post-surgery of the breast cancer. But remember, the first post-surgical change, it would just show uh, the distortion, but this, that would be the baseline for the future post-surgical changes to follow up. Excellent answer. Thank you. Uh, then there's a question about... Uh, is there a specific training for DOMO and how long is it? Correct. So in the United States, you need to have at least um, eight hours of um, uh, DOMO specific training if you did not train on um, as a resident. Like if as a resident, if you already got trained, that's fine. But when we all switched from the um, 2D to 3D, we had to do an eight-hour training. Uh, we um, did it. There was we did it like as, as I said when we started was only Hologic was the first manufacturer, and we did a Hologic training um, that um, it was about eight hours long. Okay, very good. There's a question from Dr. Victor Contehe. Very excellent presentation, exciting technology. My question is, how widely available is DBT? How widely available is the tomosynthesis? Um, in the United States, um, I would say it is actually, um, I, don't, I don't have a percentage, but um, I would, I could definitely say there's definitely majority of the, uh, uh, you know, a majority of the major cities have the um, tomosynthesis um, going on. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, when you are on the rural um, side, you know, it's definitely less, but, you know, I would say right now, uh, I would say majority of the um, uh, major cities have um, tomosynthesis. I would say like, for example, in Atlanta area, um, all of the Atlanta suburban um, hospitals have um, tomosynthesis. So, you know, um, everybody has um, tomosynthesis. And um, as far as the insurance cost is concerned, um, again, this is from the United States. Um, so in 2015, you know, um, the CMS actually um, started um, paying for the tomosynthesis. So after that, a lot of the, um, you know, private practice um, uh, facilities also started implementing the tomosynthesis because um, now the insurance is starting to pay for it. All right, thank you. The next is just a thanks for the good talk from Dr. Joseph Mozambaya from University of Rwanda. Uh, next question is, any comments about uh, DBT plus CEDM present and future or pitfall about these techniques? Okay, um, so um, I, I, we don't do um, tomosynthesis plus the, um, the contrast um, enhanced uh, mammography. So um, I would say that I do not have any experience on that um, tomosynthesis with the, um, uh, I don't have any clinical experience on the contrast enhanced mammography since we don't do it. Um, we're going to be starting doing it, but not, as of today, we are not. We're in the, in the next few weeks, we're going to be starting do, doing for it. So I don't have any uh, practical um, explain um, um, pulse or pitfalls, but I would definitely, I could definitely seeing it as a um, definitely as something um, a great experience, especially um, for countries that do not have like MRIs. I would definitely think that this would be a great um, um, screening tool, um, um, DBT with the enhanced tomosynthesis. Excellent. All right. The next question is Dr. from Dr. Joseph Muzambaya. Uh, what about radiation, especially with tumor guided biopsy? Okay. So um, 
um, what happens with the tomo guide so in radiation in general as i said so when you use the tomo synthesis with an additional uh, fulfilled digital mammography obviously the radiation is um, all, you know, it's doubled. But um, when you have, when you use the uh, full field digital um, tomosynthesis with the um, synthetic uh, tomosynthesis, obviously it is definitely um, reduced, um, um, definitely reduced. The good thing about the tomo guided biopsy with the radiation is that because we don't have to do the um, uh, the pairs and the pre-fire and the post-fire um, compared to the stereotactic biopsy, the radiation is pretty much similar as the um, as the um, stereotactic biopsy. As I said, like we you know, we only take one tomo image for pre, or as actually I would say as a scout, and um, then you don't even need to do um, a post-fire image. And then you just have to do one for the after the biopsy. So even though that one tomo slice um, stack of tomo slice might be more, but when you compare it to the additional imaging that would have been taken with the um, with the stereotactic biopsy, it almost is comparable to the regular stereotactic biopsy. Oh, great. Next question is from uh, Tombi, Dr. Tombi Dinsaki. What is the benefit of tomo synthesis? on patients with breast implants, reason artifacts, yeah. Um, um, so it is, we, so we, you, we do it for both patients with implant and, um, and uh, without implant. I know different institutions does it differently. We actually have um, the tomosynthesis only done on displaced um, views. So we do not do, on, you know, for the, we do a 2D mammogram with the implant in place, and then we push the implant and do the displaced view with the um, tomosynthesis. So because of that, I do not see a lot of artifacts with the um, implant because the implant is actually displaced on the tomosynthesis view. We do not, like I know some places do both um, displaced view with tomosynthesis and the regular view with the tomosynthesis, but we didn't want to have a added um, uh, radiation dose to patient with breast implants. So in our case, as long as you do the displaced view, with the tomosynthesis, you should not get any artifacts from the breast. Great. Uh, next question is Dr. Churis Kahisi from Rwanda. Would you recommend a breast biopsy using tomosynthesis versus ultrasound guided? Okay, so you, I always love to do the ultrasound guided biopsy because it's much more easier on the patient. It's much more easier seen. You could see the uh, your needle going through on a live, so perfect, you know, in general, even if it's a tomosynthesis um, only finding, we always take the patient to ultrasound to see if we could see the area under ultrasound. And if we can see the area under ultrasound, then we would do the biopsy under ultrasound. Only in cases that we could not see the cases under um, ultrasound that we do tomosynthesis guided biopsy. Again, it's easy for the patient, we could, it's easy for the radiologist, less, there's less radiation. So only time that we do is when we do not see um, the ultrasound correlate for a suspicious tomosynthesis finding, we take it to tomo-guided biopsy. Okay, excellent answer. We also have some questions from Dr. I think we're running out of time, so I will just send you the, an email. We have questions from Dr. Valeria Gonzalez, um, from Dr. McBulay from Sierra Leone about, about cost implications. Uh, and Dr. Fatima, uh, I think uh, for the interpretation of digital mammo, we have a lecture, Dr. Fatima Olamar, on the website. You can check it out. And if you think we need more, we can always uh, um, get another talk on digital mammo. So that's a great point. Um, Dr. Fatima Olamar is from Mohas in Tanzania. Uh, doc, and we also have a question from Dr. Jose Armando Rodriguez from Honduras. So we will send you these few questions, which were, you know we did not have time to answer. Let me just check the chat quickly if there's anything else. I think, um, and a lot of, uh, you know, excellent, uh, excellent talk, uh, congratulations. So um, very nice comments and uh, uh, from Dr. Enrique Manure, congratulations, excellent talk. Um, Dr. Maria Gomez, excellent talk. Dr. Oswald Fortson, excellent talk. 
Thanks. So thank you so much. Uh, this was excellent. I, you know, very informative and a very nice lecture. Um, uh, the, as you can clearly see, the audience really liked it. So uh, we will send you just a few questions which were left unanswered by email. But uh, thank you so much, um, Jean, for doing this for us. We really appreciate this and have a wonderful day. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining from different parts of the world and, st and stay safe during COVID-19. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you.